Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about campus protests, about accusations of anti-Semitism, about media malpractice, and numerous other topics with Richard Eskow, who has served as chief writer and editor for the 2016 Bernie Sanders campaign, a Fortune 500 healthcare executive, how those two things fit together, I have no idea, a student activist, an economic consultant in more than 20 countries, a songwriter, and a musician. Uh, I don't know how all of that is possible, but we will ask him. He is the host of The Zero Hour, found at thisisthezerohour.com, and his articles can be found at zerohourreport.com. Richard Eskow, welcome to Talk World Radio. It's great to be here, David. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so uh, briefly, how did you go through more careers than uh, you know a whole town can handle and end up doing uh, media. And I'm not done yet, by the way. Uh, wasn't uh, suggested. <laughs> no, the, uh, well, like Kierkegaard says, life can only be understood backwards, but it has to be lived forward. And, uh, you know, I was a musician get, coming out of college and I did some, you know, assistant work at UC Berkeley, programming and things like that. And then I had became a parent and I felt I had to get a real job and wound up of all things becoming a kind of uh, financial expert in healthcare and insurance and those things. Did that till I couldn't stand it anymore, basically got into public policy work. It started writing for the Huffington Post when it started and got visibility there. And and uh, Bernie called me up and uh, asked me if I wanted to go work for him. All my friends said, yeah, that'll be a three month job. And I thought, no, I think there's something there. And uh, so I was employee number five for Bernie. But by that time, I had been, you know, for 10 years or more, I had been writing lefty stuff about the economy and health care and and all of those things. So I, there's more of a through line than it may seem. Well, from uh, you started out on a college campus there, what do you make of the, of the protests across campuses in numerous countries and dozens and dozens of places in the United States now? Well, you know, there's this, I've been writing about it or thinking about writing about it, which always takes a lot longer. It is much harder work than actually writing. Um, I went down to one of the encampments at George Washington University the other day. Of course, I've been following closely. I was in my early, I was like 14 or something when the Columbia protests originally, the 1968 protests happened. So, I wasn't involved in them, my older brother was, but but I feel as if there's kind of an underground river in history of people, especially students, but not limited to, uh, with their antenna out for justice. And what I found, yeah, I think I went to my first March on Washington in 1969. Uh, so what I found, whether it was in 1969, or South Africa, uh, divestment, not, uh, that movement, or 1999, or Occupy, or now with these student protests, or Black Lives Matter, Women's March, is that the undercurrent, uh, regardless of the specifics of the political demands, there just seems to be an undercurrent of love, of positivity, of optimism, and that always seems to be uh, put up against a sort of funhouse mirror of media distortion, which is what we're seeing now. I saw nothing of anti-Semitism whatsoever in uh, in uh, the encampments I visited or in everything I've read. Instead, what I'm seeing in the media is uh, a time-honored totalitarian tactic, which in this case is being embraced by a lot of Democrats, as well as Republicans, which is find one or two individuals in a movement who say or do outrageous things and smear an entire movement. It's the sort of Willie Horton tactic of finding some person that, who passed through Columbia who said something anti-Semitic to say they're all anti-Semitic, just as Willie Horton 
the criminal in uh, the George Bush senior campaign was used to imply that all black people are, you know, without saying it, that all black people are criminal and that the Democrats are soft on black people. Well, now the Democrats are doing that as well as the Republicans with this kind of finding of these outlier people. So I've gone in and I've looked at some social science research and these students are not anti-Semitic, they're anti-Zionist, which is a very different thing. And uh, as I say, even saw nothing but love, fellowship, solidarity, I'm sure in any group of human beings, you stay together long enough, you'll find egos and conflicts and that kind of thing. But uh, they haven't experienced what some other uh, protest movements have, which is infiltration by either enemies of the movement or people who uh, you know, are inclined to violence because they're self-selecting, right? The core movement is always students at the, that particular university, although they have allies. Um, so again, I think it's a, they're doing a wonderful thing. I think they're spotlighting an, a, a terrible injustice. I think the more that the government and the media and the corporations turn against them, the more they're revealing, unraveling the threads of this sort of uh, woven, you know, set of forces beyond militarism, uh, corporatism, uh, the anti-democratic nature of our, our, our system in general. Uh, I think that in protesting the horrors of Gaza, they're also beginning to shine a light on these, you know, on this web work of his lattice work of uh, corruption and militarism that permeates our society. So, I, I read a column in the Washington Post that started out, I have read these student manifestos from these campuses and their ugly, horrible stuff and clueless as well. And I it's okay, let me see, can you quote them? And there was a link out to a New York Times article of one guy having said some horrible, disgusting, and anti-Semitic thing. And then there was discussion of some of these statements. There wasn't a single thing, ugly, horrible, anything other than praiseworthy in the whole thing. But I'm afraid people read the headline and they read the first couple paragraphs and maybe don't notice that there isn't anything there. But how do serious media outlets get away with this stuff well it's it's what they've always done you know i mean it's the big lie it's uh it's not new to american media you know i mean the irony here is you take someone like uh well trump is of german descent let's say and i you know i don't think trump is the rep repository of all evil in our system i think our system is the reality repository of all evil in our system but you know in 1918 this is what the press did uh with german americans they smeared German American churches and and associations and chambers of commerce as and newspapers as dens of anti-American hatred. They shut them down and they shut down German churches and you know twas ever thus, right? I mean they did it with the quote unquote Okies who moved from Oklahoma to California. The, you know the history there is, is of hostility towards those groups is is horrendous as i say they did it with while well, reagan did it with welfare queens although to be fair they challenged him a little bit but i wonder how many americans who read headlines about ronald reagan uh calling uh, people or uh, what's it reagan or nixon i can't remember i think it was reagan but it was reagan uh, yeah calling people welfare queens how many people read and understood that he was caricaturing one woman's experience in defrauding the system. And yet you had a whole movement, this woman, uh, one criminal managed to apply under several different names uh, and did in fact buy a Cadillac, use Cadillac with her earnings. But from that, you got the whole trope of the welfare Cadillac. There's a country song about it, right? Mm -hmm. And Richard, uh, or someone, Richard Nixon or someone asked, uh, uh, or Reagan asked uh, Johnny Cash to play it at the White House and he wouldn't. Uh, so you know the welfare the, these guys yeah. you know i can but i can uh, name the person that was in the article you followed the link to is probably this person khadija james or something uh he's in all of them and uh you know okay you 
The media looks for the welfare Cadillac because it sells newspapers, but explaining that it's not real, eh, that doesn't sell too many newspapers or, or get too many eyeballs. And if, in fact, the, the big lie it conforms with the interests of your publisher, your editorial board, your stockholders, uh, what motivation is there to expose it when it's working so well, you know, when it aligns with your own political beliefs or what have you, so. Yeah, you have to almost admire them a little, Richard Escal, in that they aren't smearing people anymore for being from the wrong ethnic group. They're smearing people for supposedly being racists, uh, for supposedly being bigoted and anti-Semitic. Uh, it's, it, it's, I don't know, it's almost a sort of progress that they're now lying about people being anti-Semitic rather than lying about Jews being horrible people. I don't know. Is that Well, is that's that one way to look at it. <laughs> Another way to look at it is, it is it's the extension of something I've worried about since the Bernie campaign in particular, which is the weaponization of identity politics, right? Bernie was, uh, and I, I don't, you know, nobody walks on water, right? But Bernie was clearly the best candidate for poor people, for black people, for uh, LGBTQ people. I mean, you may, for women, uh, his policies on childcare, on minimum wage. I mean, we could go through all of them, uh, anti-racist and so on, uh, the best. So what did they do? They said, well, he hates women. Uh, I don't see a lot of black people there. You know, the whole notion, it was to divide class interests and uh, identity. Uh, no, you don't identify with other working class people of your ethnicity, you identify with your ethnicity, so that if you're, if you're a white Jew, you identify with a billionaire white Jew. If you're a black woman, you identify with a billionaire black woman. There are a couple. Uh, so this was, you know, I think most people don't buy it, but it was enough to be somewhat effective. And I think this is the logical extension of it. Now, when Bernie was running, I have thought about writing about this, but I haven't had the nerve, frankly. When Bernie was running, and there were all these smears against Bernie supporters, supposedly, by the way, never substantiated, and any research I or anyone else did refuted it, but as being like on bros or whatever, you Bernie bros, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, I said to myself, take, I'll take 90 seconds and see how many anti-Semitic comments I can find from Democrats, from centrist Democrats against Bernie just 90 seconds, and I found eight. From, I excluded the ones that were from right-wingers or whatever, which is more than his, uh, the accusers ever did. But uh, I didn't write a welfare Cadillac article saying Hillary supporters are anti-Semitic. Why would I do that? That goes against everything I believe in. I didn't take the Khadija James or whatever his name is of, of centrist democratic ideology and and tar everybody with that brush because I, you know, I think it's morally wrong, but that's where, that's how, you know, and nobody, you know, I'm, I'll stand with anybody in terms of the, the length and the intensity of my commitment to civil rights issues, but that's where it's not about, uh, it's no longer about uh, justice. It's about weaponizing one group of people against one another, it's the inversion of, uh, you know, the right wing anti-immigrant, you know, it's a terrible mistake. And a lot of people have been pilloried for pointing that out. Um, unfortunately, now you have some people who've been rehabilitated like Adolf Reed Jr. and so on, who uh, is now writing for the nation, you know, black professor who nevertheless was uh, basically canceled. He went further than I did in terms of you know, excluding identity as a factor and basically saying it's class only. But, but uh, you know, I respect him and I, I like him personally, uh, but this has been a hard, they made it a hard topic to talk about. And it's working now because even though it was politically uh, a negative for them to talk about anti-Semitism in 2015 and 2016 when Bernie was running and there was anti-Semitism, including the kind of, uh, 
uh, unconscious anti-Semitism. I remember a couple of people wrote about the way he talks in the big hands. He was culturally a Jew of the uh, 1930s and 40s of Bronx, Brooklyn, you know, a culture. I know a lot of people like that. So that was, that could be, that's anti-Semitic, a microaggression, certainly. Uh, it wasn't politically uh, useful to talk about it then. It's politically useful to talk about it now. I think that whether consciously or not, all of a sudden, uh, to say you don't think one state should slaughter the children of another state, well, if you can call that anti-Semitic because you don't like that speech, well, it's awfully convenient. Well, this is where they may have, I'd love to hear your opinion, uh, gone farther than they meant to, in that you now have the House of Misrepresentatives banning what they call anti-Semitic speech. And Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene getting upset because shes it's occurred to her that in so doing, they've banned actual anti-Semitism to which she is passionately devoted. Uh, and I don't know what, if anything's happening in the Senate, but this seems incredible. And again, I haven't seen in the corporate media what you would think would be the appropriate response to such an action in the U.S. Congress. Well, first of all, a couple of things about that. One, an awful lot of Democrats voted for that too. Uh, so, and that's consistent with, you know, I think back to 40, 50 years ago, a lot of Democrats were committed civil libertarians. And I feel as if the trauma of 2016 and the desire to absolve themselves of personal or collective responsibility as a party for the failures of 2016 led to a kind of paranoia, a kind of moral panic uh, about Russian interference. I don't say it, it didn't happen, but it was, uh, according to all the good studies on it, politically insignificant, min min minimal, if any, factor in the outcome. Uh, but that has led them to, and of course, I'm generalizing, right? I mean, there are Great Democrats were exceptions to this, but that has led them in many cases to embrace uh, controls over speech that would have been unthinkable for the Democrats as a party 50 years ago, to embrace censorship of social media, to applaud the suppression of a legitimate news story. We could, you know, people aren't want to argue all day about Hunter Biden's laptop. It was a legitimate news story and it was suppressed. And people say, well, it was only suppressed for two days. Well, it's like, okay, you only took a police state action against a legitimate news story for two days and that's okay with you because it was in support of an electoral outcome you like. Well, this is how our freedoms are lost. And uh, the answer to bad speech is good speech. It's not censorship, but somehow that message has been lost. So to me, the extent of the democratic support for this uh, draconian anti-Semitism bill, which doesn't even include the definition of anti-Semitism, if I recall correctly, it just refers to an outside organization, and which I suppose could change its definition, but right now it's, it's so broad that any criticism of the legitimacy of the right of Israel to exist, for example, clearly considered anti-Semitic. So you have when a Democrat votes for that, a Democrat is saying, I oppose Republicans because they want to create a religious ethno state based on white Christians. But, but I also support a bill that forbids you from saying you are opposed to a religious ethno state in the Middle East. I don't get the logic. But uh, this is part of the erosion, I think, of belief in civil liberties. You know, I defend what you say to the death. Uh, right or wrong, you know, whether I agree with it or not. Now it's, you know, if I don't agree with you, death seems harsh. Uh, so that's my take. The, the, another story that did, never got remotely the attention it should have uh, was what was in 
the emails and the documents uh, that were just we were all distracted from by the Russiagate stories, uh, right? You didn't have to go out and blame uh, all smear all Hillary supporters for you know cheating Bernie or bad mouthing Bernie or nasty plots to make Bernie look bad. You could blame the Democratic National Committee, right? I mean, this is these were the people who were trying to get him labeled an atheist and and various other things, right? And we. Where, whatever happened to that story? Well, you know what happened to the story, which is they changed the subject. That's the whole point. The anti-Semitism accusations against uh, the protesters are to change the subject because they know they can't win that debate. They know there's no justifying what the students were protesting in the long run. They also know that this is what this moment in the 1980s was the beginning of the end for South African apartheid. So they know it's a big deal, more than a lot of people on the left know it's a big deal. Uh, so what can they do? They change the subject. Uh, what could they do with the revelations of, of, um, uh, of the uh, emails? They could change the subject. They, oh no, it's Russia. And then to this day, you still have a Democrats saying, well, some of those emails were fraudulent. So if you try to bring up, well, you know, this happened and, you know, so-and-so said, no, that some of them were fraudulent. None of them were fraudulent. Extensive studies were done. None were fraudulent. Same with Hunter Biden's laptop, by the way, the emails. They did at CBS and one other group independently had forensic studies done. of. A, I mean, I could care less. Had forensic studies done of the laptop. The emails, whatever you think of them, and I, I don't, you know, I think they're, the sort of generally legalized corrupt nature of American politics and how you trade on family relations, all that. Uh, no, uh, but uh, um, but they insist they were fabricated when they were not. So that's what happens there too. If you try to say that in a reasonable way, engage certain people in a conversation, once they drop that, oh, some were fabricated. If you say, well, you know, there were forensic studies. As I, I, I for example, uh, became known, I don't know how much lang language of various kinds I can use, but as, was it therefore addressed as Mr. Dick Picks? Because somehow I was, by pointing out that the emails had been forensically reviewed, I was somehow supposedly endorsing the doxing or the releasing of sexual personal photographs of Hunter Biden, which I think is gross and disgusting and unethical but uh you, you didn't know, release the stuff you just said it was real yeah yeah and uh and and the whole tag tactic it's another big lie tactic right it's, it's like if it's uncomfortable to acknowledge that uh, i i can't even remember now honestly david because i don't care that much but if it's uncomfortable to acknowledge that the big guy got on the phone or whatever uh whatever they say happened and maybe it did then you say, well, oh, you must like uh, really, how would you like it if we release sexual pictures of you? Uh, you know, I mean, I, I just, you know, the only thing we can do on our side is not play that game. I just say, you know what, I'm not changing the subject. So what, what, we've got about five minutes left and I wanna talk about the zero hour. Uh, yeah. what, what should media outlets be doing and what are you doing? Uh, that people should be paying attention to and, and how can people follow your work at the zero hour? You know, first of all, I'll answer your last question first. Zerohourreport.com is a good way. This is the zerohour.com uh, and uh, you can support us financially at patreon.com slash the zero hour. But um, look, you know, it's a, for me, it's a fine line between being fearless and I can't always say I'm automatically fearless on every subject. You know, sometimes you gotta, you know, pump yourself, you psych yourself up a little bit, but uh, of being fearless without being a jerk, you know? And I mean, there's a great market out there in, so let's call it progressive media for people who are not fearless, who will say certain things, but know where the limits are and know how to kowtow to whether it's, you know, Democratic donors or other people, they do pretty well. And then there are people, particularly in, in uh, social media distribution channels, 
who will just turn and slash at everybody on the left uh, who they can argue is insufficiently pure and uh, they have a, tend to get a great following uh, then for the rest of us, like, okay, you know, let's be fearless, but also this is not about people. This is not about personalities. This is not about who betrayed who or who's a phony leftist. Or This is about what do we need to do? What are our ideals? How do we live up to them? So for me, the challenge is always to do that uh, without uh, catering for clicks with sensationalism and hostility and yet survive right that's the trick yeah uh there's a there's a great deal of critiquing hostility and uh and modeling it at the same time uh, i i was just told by i thought a friend and ally at the university of virginia you know the the president should be forcibly dragged out of his office for having forcibly dragged those students out of that camp it's like something something goes missing. I, I wanted to ask you about visiting George Washington University because I understand there the university told the DC police, drag those kids out, and the police said no. That's, That's a story I'd like to learn more about. Yeah, well, the yeah, it's great because the DC police, you know, there's so many demonstrations here that they're highly schooled in dealing with nonviolent demonstrators. And although I've seen them do deplorable things, especially around the embassy of Venezuela and so on, they're basically, you know, no, we're not doing that. And in the case of the George Washington University students, they, uh, they didn't want to become involved in what they saw as an intra, rightly, I think, as an intramural problem. They saw no gain in it for them. They saw tremendous negatives for them. They didn't see a peaceful outcome. So uh, yeah, they were smart. They and and they're they've traditionally like, they're very reluctant to arrest protesters, even when they want to be arrested. I remember scolding some younger colleagues when they went out and didn't get arrested. You, know, you kids today, in my day, when we wanted to get arrested, we got arrested. But uh, the DC police really try to avoid that at all costs. So uh, that's what they did in this case. They just said. Yeah, this is not for us. It actually happened somewhere else. I'm trying to remember if it was Arizona or Texas, where the police came, not in Texas, so they were, they were very violent, but the police came and said, look, this is a civil matter. You know, we're not going to intervene. Yeah. Uh, but by and large, with the militarization of our police and politicization of our police, they're more than happy to beat some hippie heads, just like the old days. But it's the exception, and it's still not the lead story because it doesn't bleed, it doesn't lead. Uh, we've been speaking with Richard Escow. He is the host of The Zero Hour. You can go to thisisthezerohour.com or zerohourreport.com. Richard, thanks for everything you're doing and for coming on Talk World Radio. Oh, it was my pleasure, David. Thanks for having me. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.